This is the tragic story of Hadiza Obo, the first female pilot of Nigeria Airways, who as a senior first officer was murdered by her domestic staff on February 8, 1998. The killers were arrested, jumped bail, escaped police custody and are yet to be found, even to this day. She was only 39. Hadiza Hobo was the first and only female pilot of the defunct Nigeria Airways. She was an Amazon in not only the Nigerian aviation industry, but the world at large. She has also been hailed as a trailblazer by her colleagues in the sector and was seen as a progenitor and the future of the upcoming Nigerian women in the highly skilled sectors which has been dominated by the male folk. Apart from being an indigenous of Edo State, little is known of her early life, but as of the time of her death, she was a single lady in her late 30s who lived alone in a residence in Ekoi, a highbrow area of Lagos, the economic capital of Nigeria. As it was a large house, she had a domestic servant who helped her in running the house while she focused on her career. Unfortunately, these servants she trusted with her life would cut down her dreams as a woman who wanted to conquer the skies in her chosen profession. In 1984, Obo began her career as a flight officer aboard the Nigeria Airways Boeing 737, and by 1989, she was already a well-established pilot and remained a superstar of aviation throughout the 1990s. She has always been a point of reference and source of pride for all women associations in Nigeria and Africa. In addition to running some other activities in the house, one of the domestic servants and chief orchestrator Abdullahi served as the gatesman, security guard and gardener and had access to all parts of the house. About 8 pm on that fateful February, Hadiza Obo drove home from the airport and it was Abdullahi who opened the gate for her as she returned from work. The pilot then went to her bedroom while one of the domestic workers helped her with the flight bag. Obo's help took her flight back to her bedroom and found much more foreign currencies than normal in the bedroom along with tons of designer wares, jewel studded bracelets, gold chains and many others. And this must have fueled their desire to murder her and cut away her properties. There must have been a plan in the offing as to the extent of her material wealth which would eventually spur these evildoers into action. Hadiza Obo went straight to the kitchen to prepare a meal for herself after resting from her trip. A meal that anyone following this story would presume was her last. But she never tasted the meal. Unknown to her, her gateman Abdullahi had sneaked out and opened the gate to the other three connivers who had entered the house. Pitaiche, trained as an auto electrician, was one of the brains behind the plot, and in 1993, Obo had employed him as a gardener and gateman. He was hired because Abdullahi had been fired by Obo for gross misconduct. When Pita worked for her, he lived inside the compound in the servants' quarters. But when Peter was traveling to his village in Makordi, Obo decided to re-employ Abdullahi pending Peter's return. That error would prove extremely deadly. When Peter returned, Abdullahi moved swiftly and co-opted Peter of his sinister agenda to kill Obo, mainly because of her wealth. It has been confirmed that Abdullahi said that Obo should be killed because she had much money and properties. Pizza agreed to be part of the plot. In fact, by coordinating the other assassins who would take part in the operation, he went one step further. The meeting point for the killers was the place outside the house where Abdullahi sold his cheap products. The strategy was for the killers to skulk around in the dark and wait until Obo arrived at a residence that day. Once they saw she was comfortably inside, they carved their plan which had been painstaking and detailed. 
through the back door of the kitchen, the assassins gained access to the house. Obu was inside the kitchen cooking when they entered. But why would she cook for herself when she was supposed to have cooks? Where were they? Are her servants all men? Nevertheless, according to reports, Abdullahi pounced on the unsuspecting victim's neck with a rope that he had with him and she was overpowered despite her shouts, pleas and struggles. As the pilots gave her last kicks in a desperate survival attempt, Abdullahi, the very person she hired to protect her, strengthened his grip and tightened the noose around her throat, cutting off her brain's blood supply. In reality, strangulating her while the others attacked and restrained her. The bitter fight continued for a couple of minutes and she was left lifeless. The murderers did not stop there. They carried her corpse to the septic tank, locally and popularly referred to as Sokiwe, where they dumped her body. They then got the cement bags and cemented the tank securely. With the body of Adiza Obo secured in the septic tank, they moved to the next stage of their plans by embarking on a proper looting of her residence. They cutted everything that was valuable in her house, from her gold jewels to her expensive wares to the hard currencies. They cleared it all. Her car was turned into a taxi, and even Peter left the boys' quarters to start living in the main building that the deceased pilot had previously occupied. As a matter of fact, every time a visitor or a friend came to check up on Adiza Obo, they would respond in pigeon by saying, Madam don't travel and we don't know when she they come back. Which means, Madam has traveled and we don't know when she will return. Disappointed, her visitors would turn back assuming that the pilot had to travel or was again on her busy schedules. Nevertheless, Nemesis caught up with them as there was a policeman on duty in the house next to Adiza Obo's house who witnessed some unusual movements in and out of the residence of the late pilot which would arouse suspicions and investigations when invaders kept telling everyone their rhetoric answer. Madame not the house. That is, Madame is not at home. But the officer would not buy the story, most possibly acting on a tip-off Police officers and security agents immediately swamped the house. Peter and the rest were arrested and bundled to the police station in Nikoi. Abdullahi had vanished. Interestingly, when they were arrested by the police, no one knew that Obo was dead and buried in a waste pit. They were arrested on charges of stealing and illegally removing property which formed the basis of their investigation. Peter told the police that the late pilot had traveled and they believed him. There was no way to affirm Peter's story or contact Obo, since in 1998, mobile phones were not popular in Nigeria. The Nigerian police were still appealing to the public as of May 1998, about three months after Hadiza Obo was murdered, to assist with information to identify the prime suspect connected to her assassination. The pot of soup she was making was still on the cooker when the police arrived at her house and all dried up. The air conditioners had died and the blood stains were still visible on the floor of her kitchen. The rope that was used to strangulate her was discovered between the kitchen and its now vacant city room with all valuable items being stolen. Her enlarged portrait was the only thing left in her city room at that time and it had been covered with dust and cobwebs. The septic tank was still open with its gaping hole and there was still the half-used bag of cement. The police gave an explanation why they didn't move or touch any of the objects at the scene because they still needed them to investigate and prosecute the suspects. As this was almost three months after the unfortunate incidents, all the compound grounds were already taken over by weeds right up to the gates and gone were the days of her well-manicured lawns. Abdullahi had been named as the prime suspect who masterminded and orchestrated the whole scenario. However, after an intense manhunt, he was arrested and kept in custody. As the case dragged on, it took a broader aspect. 
as nobody knew or learned of Obo's exact location. Her family and friends asked more questions and pressured the police as the case had already drawn public attention and Nigerians were eager to know exactly what happened. Angered by the investigation's near speed, Abubakar Sav, who was the Lagos State Commissioner of Police, called for the case file, studied it, and forwarded it to the State Department of Criminal Investigation, SCID, Banti, in Yaba, Lagos. He frustrated Sav to journalists at a press briefing that the case had gone beyond theft and that the responsibility rested on the police to establish the pilot's whereabouts. Once that case was taken over by the SCID, the tempo shifted. The crack team of investigators have inspected her home on various occasions. They found on one of their visits that the septic tank had a fresh cement sheet and a half-used cement bag lying in the vicinity. The operatives became very suspicious and they went back to Kwanti to question Peter further. The SCID team was back at Obo's house the following day. They immediately opened a part of the septic tank and what they saw shocked them beyond disbelief. It was Hadiza Obo's body in a state of decomposition. The corpse was eventually recovered. At Kmanti, the SCID team were very sure that they had the assailants in their custody. Pizza, Abdullahi, Itoro Akman, Obo's driver, and one Dennis Osama, who received the late pilot's stolen goods and property. After much interrogation, Peter confessed to the crime. The four suspects were arraigned for conspiracy, armed robbery, and murder at the Chief Magistrate's Court in Lagos on June 1, 1998. While the police were seeking advice from the Director of Public Prosecutions, it was discovered that the High Court had ordered that two of the suspects should be released on bail with two guarantors. Nevertheless, against a public outcry, the Ministry of Justice advised that the perpetrators be rearranged for conspiracy, armed robbery, and murder. Unfortunately, efforts to rearrest the suspects proved to be abortive as their guarantors were alleged to have given the courts false names and fake addresses to process the bill which had aided their escape. The murderers are yet to be found even as of the time of making this video. Thus, 24 years after a horrible and senseless murder, Hadiza Obo's family and loved ones are yet to get justice. There are more stories like these to talk about, so make sure you are subscribed to the channel and have turned on notifications to receive new videos as they drop. You can check out our next video to know more about how Bola Ige and Funcho Williams were assassinated.